Did you know that a lot of our favorite house plants that have been on the market for a while are steeped in folklore and myths? If you're curious to find out more about these stories, stick around and let's look into it. Hi, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today's going to be an interesting video topic, and I will start off this entire video with heavy caveats. I am not part of most of these cultures where these myths and folklores have originated from, I also remember having taken notes of these myths and folklores from books that I've been reading over the years because I found it really, really interesting. Side note, I'm kind of really into mythology and anything to do with folklore generally. So these things were super interesting to me. So the reason why I'm saying this is take all of this with a pinch of salt, basically. So. Anybody who has ever studied anything along the lines of mythology or folklore will know that these are stories that are passed down from different generations, different cultures, even pockets within those same cultures might have differing stories. So I do encourage you, because actually a lot of these myths and folklore, from what I can remember from different regions of the world, I have actually got viewers from those different regions. So if the stories that I'm talking about are not entirely accurate to the way that you remember them, or if I'm talking complete rubbish, please do let us know down below and let us know the story as you know it. But yeah, and also <laughs> I can't not touch on the fact that this is very much a white person talking about a lot of stories and myths and folklore that came from more kind of indigenous cultures to a lot of places around the world. That's why I'm saying I am not an expert, but I do encourage the people from those cultures, as I said, do drop your stories down below. But I thought at least it's the beginning of a conversation. So the plants that we're going to be looking at today are the Monstera deliciosa, the Areca palm, the Pachira aquatica, the Sansevieria, now a dracaena, but essentially the snake plant, and also the peace lily or the spathiphyllum. There is also mention from what I remember from a while back for the Calathea orbifolia, but that one's the one that I'm most iffy about. I will include it, but just be aware that that's a bit of an iffy one, I think. But without further ado, let's talk about the first plant. So the first plant that I want to touch on is the Monstera deliciosa. We know and love the Monstera deliciosa. I'm trying to see, I used to have one here, that's why I'm pointing at the back here, it's no longer with me. But the Swiss cheese plant for a lot of different people, it's the quintessential houseplant, or it has been, especially during this renaissance of houseplants generally. Um, and from what I remember, kind of when I was doing my research, this is kind of a myth that comes from South America, if I'm not mistaken. So kind of South America, Latin America. And essentially the story goes that they believe that the Monstera Deliciosa was brought to Earth by a cosmic star falling onto the Earth. And I think that's kind of where the, the splits in the leaves and everything come along. It's very reminiscent, if you kind of squint hard enough, to kind of a star or kind of what they would see as the, the kind of outlines of the stars. Which I find really interesting. It's really... a lot of these stories, I think, are quite kind of mind-blowing to, to think people back then, before TV, before the internet, before any of many, many hundreds of probably years ago, actually, where they were trying to put reason to something that they might have not necessarily understood. Like the average person back then wasn't going to be a botanist, but they were seeing these splits on the leaves and they were trying to understand why these were happening. So they were trying to humanize or at least bring these plants kind of structures and everything into their own understanding. So these stories kind of originated from there. 
And in terms of the folklore for the Monstera Deliciosa, and this is very true for a lot of folklore and myths around a lot of these houseplants that we're going to look at today, and generally speaking, they are meant to bring prosperity and abundance to a household. That's why a lot of people decide to put it in their house. Something I remember reading a while back as well is that it can also help bring good fortune to couples or burgeoning relationships, essentially. So a lot of people decide to give their other half, or they used to at least decide to give their half, the other half, a uh, Swiss cheese plant or Monsero Deliciosa for that reason, which I think is exceptionally cute. It's, it's one of those things that, this is maybe something that we all forget, especially people that have been collecting houseplants for a lot of time. There's, there's been a steep history behind these plants and their stories behind them. And as somebody that was really into mythology, I mean, for people that have been here for a while, I am originally Greek, basically, half Greek, half Italian, actually. But heavier on the Greek side, essentially. I was really into mythology and I still am fascinated by mythology from all over the world. So, and the way that I like to rationalize mythology in kind of today terms is, these are stories that people used to tell and to talk to amongst each other, possibly around bonfires, around the dinner table, all of these things way, way, way back then. And again, I can talk about Greek mythology because it's all intrigue and infidelities and all of these things. If you think about it slightly, before TV, before any of these things, before books, before people could probably even, like the majority of people could properly read, these were the soap operas of the day. That's why a lot of these have got so, all these things happening and infidelities and wars and strife and all of these things. So I think it's really, really cool to kind of look into this and it kind of gives you a bit of an idea of a psyche of what people were kind of experiencing around them at that point. So moving on to Pachira aquatica, which still to this day, a lot of the times the common name for it, it's one of the many money trees or money plants in the kind of houseplant world. And there's good reasons for this. Now this is one that I have seen different stories from different places, basically. Majority of the places start in the Far East, I think predominantly in China. And so I'll tell you both stories that I've heard along the way. One, which is, I think is during the Han Dynasty. And again, any of my Asian followers that might know different stories to this, please do let me know down below. I know you probably will, but I find it exceptionally interesting. So I think apparently during the Han Dynasty, somebody created um, a, a metal sculpture that looked like this tree and put it outside their home and it brought abundance or prosperity or it was seen as some form of an omen and I think there's some links to coins and I'll come back to coins in just a moment but then I also remember reading a while back another story about kind of where it got its kind of name the money tree and essentially I think it was something along the lines of somebody who wasn't very wealthy again in China or kind of Asia generally, um, and prayed to the gods essentially to give him some better fortune. I think he either found a seed, I think it might have been a seed of the plant, planted it down, and that didn't necessarily bring abundance, but I think, and this is where it gets a bit iffy, is the plant's kind of stems or trunk kind of braided itself or kind of wound itself around itself and then he proceeded to sell these plants on, and that's what brought prosperity and abundance to the family. Uh, that one sounds, mm, mainly because a lot of people that have seen Petura aquatica, it's, there's a lot of human intervention for the braiding. It might have not, the, maybe the original story wasn't braiding necessarily, but it was kind of the, the, um, the stem of the plant kind of wound around itself basically and created an interesting structure. I don't know. But this is fascinating, and this is the bit that I always find really interesting about folklore is loads of different stories, don't know where they originated from, don't know, none of these are probably scientifically accurate in any way or form, but we don't know what the origin story was necessarily. It's probably changed further down the line. I think, uh, I don't remember what the English expression is. In Greece, we call it a broken telephone. So, you know, when you're in a group of friends and somebody whispers a word in your ear and then you need to then whisper it into the other person's ear and it kind of goes along further down the line until the last person who then says this is what i heard and it's got nothing to do with the original 
word that was said in the beginning. It's very similar a lot of the times with myths and folklore. It changes the more it's passed down through different generations or different kind of cultures or subcultures. So the Petura Aquatica or the money tree is one of those things again, abundance and prosperity as the name would suggest. So a lot of people in terms of kind of how it's progressed in terms of folklore, people will put it in their houses because they think it attracts wealth and prosperity. And this is a bit that I was talking about with the coins. If I'm not mistaken, some cultures will also tie red ribbons, I think, or coins onto the tree to help increase that notion of prosperity and bringing more money into the family, into the household, all of these things, which I think is exceptionally interesting. And I remember, I don't know, I think this might be a recent tradition, but when I was living in Cyprus, there was um, a civil war that happened um, a few years back, and there was a lot of people, and I can't remember now, my history is so bad, I, I, was I never really paid attention to traditional history. It was very much into kind of ancient history and mythologies, but traditional history. <laughs> but I think it's to honor people that have died in war, or people that might be missing in war, that a lot of people back there would tie yellow ribbons for remembrance on branches of trees, and it usually happens around a national holiday. So yeah, I think, these are all quite interesting on how some of these traditions link back into plants and plant life and, and kind of how that all ties in. Moving on to the Eureka palm. And this is the one, again, might be a bit iffy, but I'm 100% I'm sure that I know I've got viewers and followers from kind of India generally. I think this is linked more so towards kind of the, the Hindu culture really. And it's meant to be a really, at least from what I remember reading, it's meant to be a really, uh, a plant that will bring good fortune within that kind of culture. And the story, as I remember it, I think it's something to do along the lines that the, the palm was created from the fruit of kind of a divine tree. Um, it was one of its fruits from that tree, and it is meant to be something that can be quite auspicious to that culture. Again, this I'm trying to be as respectful as possible. I'm just trying to remember the stories that I remember them. They might not be entirely accurate, but if you do know the a different story, please do share them down below. And I think the tree was kind of a wish-fulfilling tree, and it happened around a great churn or something like that. It was something to do with, like... Uh, the sea was churning and it was uh, kind of gods and demons and all of these things. I think I find the, the, the Hindu kind of religion really quite interesting. And it's one of the, the kind of religions that I really want to look into in terms of, because they've got some really beautiful stories that is part of that religion, essentially in that culture. And I do want to get into it a bit more. So I'm trying to be as respectful as possible. As I said, this might not be right. I've got how many caveats am I going to put in this video? But you can tell that I want to do it justice, basically. So yeah, the folklore behind the Eureka Palm is that it's considered kind of auspicious and sacred. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it might still be used in some form or another. It might be the seed itself in some of the Hindu rituals. I'd be really interested from any of my followers from, the, from that faith, essentially. Is that true? Does that hold true? Is that something that used to happen and maybe doesn't happen anymore? Has it been substituted with something else? I'd be really curious. And I think there's, there's been associations with this plant in terms of kind of warding off evil. And again, there's another plant that's coming further down the line that has got some of that folklore behind it. It's not just all about prosperity, but it's also about keeping away the evil. So yeah, this is really interesting, I think, for this one. And coming on to the Calathea orbifolia, and I said, this one's a bit meh. I remember reading a very vague reference of this somewhere in a book. And I think it was myth and folklore rather than just stories, basically. And it's, it's the story behind the fact that within the regions where it grows naturally or endemically, there is this belief that the Calathea orbifolia, because of those big, big leaves and those ornate leaves, is a place where tree spirits, not tree spirits, forest spirits, might reside. 
and they are there to kind of look after the forest and the inhabitants around those kind of areas to make sure that everything is still harmonious and everything like that. And it kind of makes sense because it's it's a relatively specific shape of plant, and those leaves are very big and very ornate. So you can kind of imagine that maybe there is some truth in terms of kind of older cultures that might have seen this and just kind of gone, "Ooh, that's probably where it is. That's probably where that tree or oh, tree again." forest spirit lives. So the folklore behind this is that apparently the plant is meant to promote calmness and well-being in the household. <laughs> what, what everybody twitches in the corner, especially people that have tried to grow Calathea, any Calathea or Calathea or Bifolia and haven't succeeded. <laughs> I don't know how calming that experience is. It might be, and again we all need to remember that if these stories originated from local cultures to where this plant might grow, if those cultures were trying to grow that plant in their garden, in their house and all these things, it probably meant that they could do a really good job at it because the, the conditions would have been very similar and they probably intuitively knew how to care for these plants without even them realizing what they were doing. It's the same thing as somebody being very impressed about maybe somebody in the UK growing whilst the light comes out and blinds me, somebody in the UK may be growing an olive tree successfully, whilst pretty much most Greek people in Greece can grow an olive tree generally in their garden without even really thinking about it. But it's endemic to that kind of region as far as I'm aware. And moving on to a more succulent type plant, so the Sansevieria or the snake plant, specifically now called the Dracaena. I do thank everybody that always reminds me on my videos that it has since been reclassified. I am fully aware, same thing about the Calatheas generally now being called Goperteas. I am fully aware. It just takes a while for it to sink in. So yeah. So onto the snake plant, and this would be from cultures from where it originated from, and that is from kind of Africa generally. And the belief, as far as I remember reading, is that because of its shape, and it's that kind of lance shape and kind of upright sharp point as well, it's meant to guard against evil spirits because I think that the thinking behind that, and if you think about it more about the, is it the whale fin Sansevieria, it's very shield-like, the way that, they, that those cultures would have lifted it, so it would ward off the evil spirits, which I think is so interesting. It kind of makes sense if you would imagine being part of that culture however many years ago and looking at this plant and trying to figure out maybe what it might symbolize or what it might do, you would think about it and it's just like, oh, that's obviously what it does. It creates a shield between all these evil spirits, which might be why certain kind of groups of people in Africa might be growing, wanting to grow this kind of around where people are living because it protection. If I'm not mistaken in terms of folklore, this plant is still potentially or was used in rituals, again just to bring in that notion of the protection against the evil spirits. I do think that there's still a lot of people, and I think even now in Greece, and Greece isn't that far away from Africa, there is still that notion of putting a snake plant near your front door because it helps keep away the bad juju. So that's really interesting. I don't know if anybody else has got any similar experiences with snake plants in their culture or where they kind of live and reside. But if you do, do let us know down below. And wrapping up with a really interesting one, which is the peace lily or the spathophyllum, basically. This is one that predominantly, as far as I remember reading into back when I was doing, uh, when I was kind of looking into, I want to say research, I wasn't doing research, I was just interested in, in libraries or finding different books on plants a few years back and I kind of came across a lot of this. This one is, as far as I'm aware, more steeped within kind of the, the Christian myth and folklore and kind of traditions and it is meant to symbolize that kind of sense of purity and redemption and I think some of the places that I was reading was the fact that apparently it was it was left in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve were ejected out of it and that's maybe where the purity and the redemption comes in. I know in Greece there's kind of notions of peace lilies being related to the Virgin Mary again for the purity aspects of all of these things. So 
yeah, it's it's a really really interesting one that's very heavily steeped in that kind of culture, really. And if I'm not mistaken, the the kind of the the deeper story I think with the with the Garden of Eden is the fact that I think it was something that apparently Eve left behind, and the the pure white bloom is to symbolize her desire for forgiveness and redemption, essentially. So it's really, really interesting when you kind of look at how people were trying to figure some of these things out. It's really, what I find even more interesting is that we've got kind of folklore and myths. Again, I can always relate it back to my culture because I can talk a bit more from authority from that one, is that something like a spathophyllum isn't a native plant, but these stories and myths somehow ended up with us and we'd, we kind of related it back to kind of the Virgin Mary. How? I don't know. But again, also it might be that maybe these myths and stories did start off with some of the earlier Christian groups within the regions where this plant would grow naturally. And again, it's how they were trying to relate things back to it. And it kind of trickled down to other cultures further down the line. I don't know, but I think it is fascinating. Again, the folklore behind this, and I can talk about this because it is the case in Greece a lot of the times, if you bring a peace lily in your house, it is meant to bring in serenity and calmness and peace and that kind of notion of tranquility. But yeah, I think that's the end of the storytelling video. A bit different than my usual videos, but generally speaking, based on kind of comments that I've got on previous videos, these slightly off-kilter videos that are not just me holding up a plant and just going, this is how I care for it, tend to resonate quite nicely with a lot of you. I think it might be because it's one of those things that you put in the background whilst you're doing some of your plant chores. Hopefully you've enjoyed. If you like this and you've got your own kind of myths and folklore around certain plants that maybe I didn't cover on this or different ones from the ones that I covered here, do let me know down below and if you're comfortable let me know as well and maybe I can do a second video of this. This might become its own series or mini-series. I don't think there's probably that many myths and stories that I might be wrong. And a preemptive apology if this offended anybody from the cultures that I was talking about because as I said this is what I remember reading. It might not be accurate but if you want to share yours do so please down below. I would love to find out a different story. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon, and I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of the day. Thanks. Bye.